so let me kind of back into that a little bit then today, for starters. Um, it'll be a little bit of a review with the Kirby production possibilities frontier as well. So imagine we got computers and toys. Let's say we got a situation like this. We got computers and toys. Is this based on published images? Yeah, I'm just going to kind of back into it, do a little bit of review from, from where we're at. So let's say we've got a production possibilities frontier. And currently we are at this point A. And maybe that's at uh, 10, we got a little 9 here, a little 11 here. Uh, so that this is like something like this. I'm just putting a little dash line. Uh, the slope of this dash line is negative 2. So let's start there for today. What does that mean? Yeah, what does that mean? Um, not necessarily, but it could be. What do we know for sure if this is the production possibilities frontier? <coughs> That's where the opportunity cost of the mother toys could be. Yes. So we don't know the world price without me stating that it is. So anytime you see a point at the, uh, a point on the production possibilities frontier and then the slope identified, it's always the opportunity cost of whatever you're measuring on the horizontal axis. So in this case, um, the opportunity cost of one toy is two computers. So cheating a little bit here, this would probably be off of this, but let's say that this is 12 roughly at this point, down two over one, you know, something like that. Okay, so now um, what if the world price was one? What if the terms of trade were equal to one, um, one computer per toy? So remember this is two computers per toy. What does that tell you about this country's situation if the terms of trade were different than that. Okay. And what direction do they need to head? So yes, if they're not equal to each other, then there's gains to trade to be had. And what would they do? Where would they shift? More computers or less computers or more toys or less toys? What would be their thing? Less toys, more computers. Less toys, more computers. Well, how do you know that? Because the slope is. So you just kind of visualize the slope? Okay. So you can think about it with the equation, possibly. Um, in my country, a toy costs two computers. Around the world, one toy costs only one computer. So do I have a comparative advantage in toys? Am I the high cost producer of toys or the low cost producer of toys? High cost. High cost, right? So in my country, 
one toy costs two computers. Around the world, one toy costs one computer. So I'm the high cost producer of toys. In a two country model, that makes me a low cost producer of the other good, is one way to look at it. But for sure we know that I could be uh, not producing as many toys and producing more of the other good and then trade to get toys. So that's the, that's the concept. Graphically, if we've got a slope of one, is it flatter or steeper than this? Flatter. And so there's your football region, if you want to think of it that way, which means we want to head that direction, or it'll be beneficial to move to a new tangent line. So um, if we, so we could, well, maybe I'll put that in. Eh, maybe I won't. Let's uh, just jump up to here. If we move to point B, I'll try to keep it. Slope is negative one. There's my point B. And now I'm going to give up one of my computers that I'm specializing in that I have a comparative advantage in. I give up one, I get one. I give up two, I get two. And I can be at 11 computers and 10 toys compared to where I was. So that was the concept we did last time of getting outside the production possibilities frontier. And that was really similar concept to what we did with the Riccardi model, except now we've got the bowed out production possibilities frontier. All right, any questions on that? Why? Is the Ricardian a flat, or yeah, flat line and being in the boat house production, production possibility frontier system? Just the assumptions of the model. With the Ricardian model, you're talking about this being straight, yeah. right? Yeah, why is it not? Right? So the production possibilities frontier looked like that because the there was constant returns to our, our factors. So we had a, a straight line. I can use labor for the equally productive for computers or toys. The more realistic story is that. I've got some people who are really good at making toys. They're skilled in the toy making area so and less people here. And that gives us the bowed out look when you start to have um, labor that's different. So the balance of the resource is different. OK. Um, so what are the implications then once we um, start trading. So when trade occurs, prices domestically change. So within our country, we're going to start having cheaper toys in this example. So now we have cheaper toys, for instance. We're getting to take advantage of the world prices. And what the stolper samuelson theorem brings into the picture is what's going to be the transitions over time to make some predictions on the uh, factors that are used um, to make those goods. So just to help motivate this, we can think of the labor market for toys and the labor market for computers. So remember, in our country, we make both of them now. We're not fully specializing in one or the other. And there is a domestic supply and demand curve for labor toy labor in the United States. And this would be the wage paid to toy employees. And this would be the wage paid to computer employees. And again, there'd be some domestic supply and demand curve determining those factor prices within the United States. And here's our home base starting place here. Let's call it W1 and W1 over here. I'll just 
leave off the quantity for now. So here's kind of pre-trade, right? At point A, let's say. What happens when we um, engage in trade and move to point C? What happens in these labor markets? What's your prediction on the wages? Okay, why do you say supply? Because there's only a set number of hours that we have in the country and so if we reallocate the resources that we've already established that they run on, there, there's a possibility of increase. So every month is an hour that can be, be used and they have to be. Who's the, who's the supply curve for in the resource market? Households or firms? Households. Okay, so it's the number of hours that they're working. Um, can they jump to different jobs easily? Like, I work here today, tomorrow I work there. No. So that, that, that's, that might be a longer run effect, or it would be a longer run effect that we'll get to. But the more immediate effect is on prices. And so part of that Stolper-Samuelson assumptions, what did you have down? What were the assumptions? Taylor, you want to read them off? I thought you had them. Um, number one, labor earned will be propor proportionate to scale. Okay. Number two, owners of capital earn profit. Okay. And number three, land owners earn rent. Yep. And then what was the last thing we said? The very last thing we left with? The amount of income to each depends on both the demand and supply of input. Yep. And the last, very last thing. <laughs> the derived demand part. So input demand is a derived demand. Okay, so if we start to think about what's happening to prices within each country, um, what is going on in those markets? Is the demand for computers, for domestically made computers going up or down? Is the demand for domestically, um, uh, domestically produced toys going up? Are we building more toys? No, no we're building less. Mm -hmm. So demand is going down. So demand starting to fall here, the demand for labor, because we're shifting into computer production rather than doing toy production. is one way to think about it. And so the world price of computers is falling, or of toys rather. It, we used to have high priced toys now we've opened up to world trade, prices are falling. And so we don't need as many people. So the demand curve is shifting. So let's call it D1. And part of that, uh, what's driving that is um, not that the people are less productive, because remember the demand curve is price times marginal product. If we have a perfectly competitive market, it's just that prices are falling to world prices now. So the price of toys in the United States is falling, therefore we're not going to be hiring as much toy labor. On the flip side, the demand for computers is going up. Prices are rising, relatively speaking, <coughs> and so they are moving to D1. And so you've got wages falling in one sector, and wages rising in another sector. Are those are both domestic diagrams or international? Yeah, domestic, yeah. So we're thinking about the transition that's going on in the United States. And so these are the, the toy labor union is crying because they're getting hurt. And they are getting hurt, right? This is our people getting hurt in the toy industry. This is our people getting helped in the computer industry. Okay. On the definition on the PowerPoint, it's like there's a part of the underline that says that the abundance factors will benefit while the scarce ones will be hurt. Is yep. Kind of I, I'm, yep, I'm getting there. So I wanted to kind of lead this in with it. Um, so short run effect, 
to think about the short run, um, we've got an increase in the computer wages and a decrease in the toy wages in the sectors in each industry within the country. Now the longer run effect, what is going to be people's response to that? Now we're kind of touching back to what maybe John was thinking. Where do you want to work? Do you want to learn how to be a toy maker or a computer maker? Computer maker, right? So in the long run, either the people who lost their jobs here will need to be retrained into computer making to go to move into the emerging sector. The quicker that happens, the less pain there is during this transition. But if labor markets are fairly inflexible, then the pain might be a little prolonged. And the more highly skilled this job is, the tougher the transition will be, right? If this is kind of a technical thing and you need a two-year degree or a, you know, some sort of education training, and that's where we get back to that video that we did last time, that short video on maybe retraining uh, the labor force. But that would be the longer run transition is a decrease in the supply of toy makers, uh, toy labor, remember we're in the labor market, and an increase in the supply of computers. And you can see how what our prediction in the long run is for the payments to labor. Do these tend to diverge from each other or converge? Converge. So supply is going to do what for toys? Decrease, driving the wage up, Max. Wow. Check out the golf club action yeah. here, right? So wages are going to head up. People are going to be attracted to the computer market. Wages are going to head down. And we get the equalization um, for transient differences. Um, if there's truly permanent differences, then there might be a permanent difference between you know, what toy, toy people who know toys and people who know computers will be paid. And so there could be compensating wage differentials that we might not get to perfect convergence. But over time, we'd start to have this longer run effect. Let me just kind of head the direction here so that we'll be starting to equalize. So in the long run, this would happen, and wages would tend to equalize slash converge. So the, um, one of the interesting things that come about from this is thinking about the specific factors. So this touches on, and I think Max brought this up here on the abundance thing. So note, <coughs> um, not all factors used in export countries uh, I just did say export industries here I keep losing where am I not all factors, not all resources used in export industries uh, will be better off. <clears throat> and not all import competing factors will be hurt. Abundant factors will benefit. Scarce factors 
will be hurt. So write that down. That, that's, a, that's an interesting nut to crack. But it, it's one of the important conclusions from this. So what do you think? So our export industry was computers, remember? And our toy makers were the ones where it was going down. And we can kind of abstract ourselves maybe a little bit from what I did here. But just why, why does that make sense? John? Because of the way we separated those when the opportunity cost was down to a relative abundance of computers wasn't there anymore. Uh, we didn't actually get into it, but there, the, uh, there was an abundant, there's some abundant factor in that industry. So it could be capital, it could be labor, it could be skilled labor versus unskilled labor. So these are the types of things that could be different. What this is claiming is that not all factors used in the export industry will be better off. So in our computer example, um, we have lots of factors of production involved. Not everybody for sure will be better off. Oh, I work for computers, so I'm better off. That's not what this is saying. It's possible that some will be worse off. So it's not immediately obvious why. What do you think? So let's just take uh, well, I don't know which one I want to take. So let's say we're so in the computer industry. Let's just say we use um, eighty percent skilled labor, five percent unskilled labor and I guess we got 15% capital or something, I don't know. <coughs> I think the gut feeling is that everybody's made better off if you're in the computer thing. This is saying that the unskilled people might not be made better off, even if they work for computers. Why? Yeah. Taylor? They could lose their jobs. They could lose their jobs. Um, they're still needed. Their jobs are still needed. So I think in some ways they have job security. So we need to think about how you're made better off or worse off. So that would work to their benefit. I think they, let's just say, we're not assuming that the production function has changed. So we still need these unskilled people, but how might they be different? Their factor to the actual production of the computer is negligible compared to the skilled labor. And that they're not. Yes. Okay. Dot. Over the long haul, but even in the in the short haul, the thing we're not that that is kind of I think the missing piece to the puzzle is to keep in mind the other good too. So what happened in the toy industry? Let's say that in the toy industry, we have um, ten percent skilled labor, um, seventy-five percent unskilled labor, and I guess I'm back to 15% capital. We'll keep that even. I'm just kind of making this up as I go. So. These guys are getting hurt, right? We kind of all agree that this is the declining industry, right? So now, does this help you out at all? This theorem, the Stolper Samuelson theorem, is claiming that this is the emerging sector, but yet these guys may not be helped. This is the declining sector. This is the abundant factor. And they're going to be getting hurt the decline, because it's the declining sector. Does that help? 
what is our big thing in econ, like the top, one of the top three things that we think about whenever we confront a problem? Opportunity costs, right? So what's happening to wages in this industry? Up or down? Right. So what's happening to your opportunities as an unskilled laborer over here? Going down. You don't have any bargaining power, right? So your other opportunities as an unskilled laborer are going down. So when you go to ask your boss for a raise, they say, well, you guys are a dime a dozen. Here's 75% people over here that aren't, don't have a job. I already think I can pick them up for three quarters of the pay I'm paying you now. So you can keep your job. No, I'm trying to be all hard butt with it, but you get the picture, right? I mean, that, that's the economic forces that are going on behind the scenes is that these guys have fewer opportunities now because they are in that camp. So that's an interesting twist to this whole thing. Yes, so right. the skilled labor is in the computers, even though it's an emerging sector, still have more opportunities to compose. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, in the emerging sector, so now... Because they're also losing opportunities. So this is the emerging sector. Do they need more skilled labor or less? More. More. Where do they go to? The few people over here. So did that work good for these people? Yes. So not all factors used in the export industries will be better off. Not all import competing factors will be hurt. We're competing now. American toy people are competing with overseas, but their skilled labor people are made better off because of that because their opportunity cost is now to go to the emerging sector. So if these guys want to keep this guy around, you got to bump up their pay. So the factor that's abundant is kind of the, the one you want to be with. And if you're not there, then you get into that long run effect of maybe you need to get there. So some of these unskilled people, maybe they can go back and get retrained into whatever the the uh, emerging industry is, or the, uh, the one that's growing. So we've got decline and growth in multiple areas. We learned from Ricardo that the growth outweighs the loss. The gaining sector outweighs because there's gains from trade. And so there's going to be a bigger pie, but the distribution of that pie could change. And it's going to favor the abundant factors, whatever those are. Okay. Questions or more comments on that? I gotta write this down. I just kind of made that up on the fly. I kind of like that. I think that that helps. That's a that's a confusing topic, or could be potentially confusing. Um, okay. Number three. Let's add another wrinkle to it. The long run effect was what for labor? Who's going where? If you're workers, what was the long run transition in the labor market in our example? If laborers are currently making toys, what might they want to do in the long run? Make computers or obtain the skills to make computers. Well, what if they can't? What if we have some factors of production that are specific to an industry and kind of immobile, right? So that's the next wrinkle we're gonna add on to this. And uh, I was kind of labeling, and I don't know if you guys still have this in your notes, but I had number one as uh, the HO model. Number two was Stolper Samuelson theorem. Number three, uh, these are kind of the main topics of the chapter, uh, specific factors model. So HO assumes factors are mobile. And by the way, BTW, in economics, if you have perfectly flexible markets and perfectly flexible resources, nobody gets hurt. You just jump over to that other industry, right? 
whatever's emerging, boom, tomorrow you go to work. So imagine the more flexibility that we can add to the resource base, the, the less problems there are with, with change. So by the way, um, perfectly flexible resource markets have no problems um, adjusting to change. The problem is that's not real. That's an economic model. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't reality. But if it was, at least it tells us the direction. The more flexible we can do it, the, um, when we think about innovations like video conferencing and some of the other technologies that have changed has that made labor more flexible more mobile or less flexible less mobile more flexible more mobile good thing right so all of these changes as we go through time we uh, we can from an economic standpoint look back and say technology good if it adds to flexibility and mobility of resources right it might hurt you with your little local monopoly that you have because of asymmetric information that you can somehow protect, right? So it might hurt you at a micro level, but at a macro level, um, that will be good and efficient for um, overall trade and exchange. Okay, so um, this model, specific factors model, this model assumes number one. Uh, land and capital, land and or capital are immobile. And cannot migrate. These are the specific factors. And again, bear in mind, some capital we can maybe move. We can move a computer. If our capital is a computer, we can move from one location to the next, right? But if it's a building that's attached to the land, it's not so mobile. So land and capital, these concepts of having some specific factors. All right, number two, labor in the model again will be assumed to be fully mobile. Labor is fully mobile which again, under certain circumstances, might not be realistic, and can migrate uh, from one sector to another. So we're going to call this the variable factor. So we're just imagining an economic model where we have specific factors and variable factors in an industry for the production of a good or a group of goods. So what's going to be the implication of that? Um, what do you think? We just worked through the HO model and thought about the implications. If we now add in this immobility of some, what do you think the implications are going to be of immobility? Magnifying effect. Okay, like what? Like one change becomes drastically important because it can't regulate itself faster. Or can't be. Okay, other comments? Okay, yeah, that, that's a possibility. Other thoughts? Okay, changes in wages might be more drastic because of one factor being fixed. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have that substitution maybe quite as easily. That's, that's a possibility. 
So do you want to be an abundant or a scarce specific factor? If you had to pick yourself, I want to be a factor someday when I grow up. Do I want to be a variable factor or a specific factor? And then do I want to be an abundant specific factor or an abundant variable factor? Abundant variable or specific? If you're specific, what happens to those variable factors over time? They change. So in our labor market, wages went <coughs> up, and then where'd they go? Down. Down. They equalized over time so you have the through the transition and the migration of labor between markets in the long run, the wages equalized. Well, you can build more of a specific factor. Now, if the specific factor is land, and there's no, and it's all built up, if it's Manhattan or something, then yeah, you might be screwed. And then who owns the land in Manhattan is very rich, right? Because everybody wants to get in there. So your ideal place in life, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, is if you own a specific abundant factor, then you're kind of so, uh, sitting good because you will enjoy the upward surge of the payments on rent and then you won't have any competition in the long run although in the long long run there's competition everywhere right that that just gives incentive to innovate and come up with new things so we're kind of holding that issue constant so in the long run we're probably all screwed anyway maybe I'm with Keynes in after all or in the long run we're all dead so uh, just enjoy it while you can <laughs> but, uh, you'll have a long run of, of some uh, economic profits, potentially. All right, so uh, the key point is that a country's, a country's endowment of a specific factor uh, plays a more critical role. Is a more critical role for determining comparative advantage. Best to own, best to own a <coughs> an abundant specific factor in the emerging industry. Although what the HO model told us is that you can have a specific factor uh, potentially in, a, uh, in another industry and still gain some uh, gain from that as well because of opportunity cost. So you can contrast that with variable factors. Variable abundant factors enjoy short run gains but benefits diminish with migration from the declining industry to the emerging industry. This is domestic. Right? Yeah, yeah, we're just kind of thinking domestically within our country.